Welcome to White Belt MMA, where you learn as we learn. What an exhausting weekend of MMA action. Uh, two Bellator cards, LFA card, first ESPN card for the UFC. You got Cage Fury Fighting Championships and Cage Warriors on Fight Pass. I'm not even gonna lie, like I watched those or had time to watch those. <laughs> um, hopefully I'll catch up with those later in the week, but and with all that being said, honestly, I, I feel like I'm a little disappointed after all these fights. I don't know about you, but... Not everybody disappointed, though. Yeah. There was, first of all, a number of dubs among the many people who did that. Those were mostly kind of decisions, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. We have to go through yeah, kind of play-by-play play play yeah. to check that out. But at least three finishes I could think of. One of those finishes... The Cain Velasquez and the Ghana one is questionable. We'll get to that later because that's that heavyweight bad yeah, boy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the uh, the Brazilian boy, what's his name? Uh, oh, Vicente. Luque. Vicente. I don't Luque. know if it's Luke or Luque. I yeah. Got, I got and uh, Bam Bam. Uh, Barbarena. Barbarena. Yeah. That fight that tough. ended in a finish. Yeah. And then uh, you could call it a conflict of interest if you want, but I will debate you on that matter too. My teacher or professor or profe, Maestre Cron Gracie, won his uh, debut in the UFC. He's actually had a two year layoff since his last fight. And actually, within those two years is when I've been training with him. It's for the past year and a half, I've been doing jujitsu with him. And then, did you know that he was fighting months. MMA before you got into his? 100%. School? Yeah. This is not like a mysterious chicken or egg question this is not an accident that ended up in his gym i was living up in central california training three months in bjj under a charles gracie affiliate before i came to back to move back to la and when i moved back to la i said i want to be in that hicks and gracie goat founders lineage, lineage. lineage yeah. and i want to learn that practical like that theory made into practice a, a fighter and a teacher, a teacher who's also a fighter and right. who's an active fighter. So he was fighting in Ryzen at the time when I knew about him. He had his four fights and he spaced them out in a very healthy manner once a year, <laughs> seemingly always in December. Healthy or about that money, contract disputes and whatnot, but we'll see. Yeah, you could say it's a little bit of both, but he's been working on his striking a lot. As you saw, he caught Caceres, Alex Caceres, who's a, you know, He's an everything guy, kickboxer. but mainly a kickboxer, yeah, yeah. and he caught him with a, a one nice two. I left. think it was a one-two as well. Yeah, it was strong. It rocked him a little bit. It didn't. It didn't knock him down to the ground, but it made him stumble a little bit. I mean, let's, let's be perfectly it clear. Up. It wasn't the most technical one-two, but it was a one-two. He hit him with it. Well, it set up yeah. the performance of the night. It's true. Which true. once he got his back, and I actually might have to look at that footage again because I don't know how he got his back. But once he got his back, that was all she wrote. That's, I mean, it was incredible, and I think that um, Crone, I don't know if he can do this with higher competition. I mean, obviously, they probably gave him a tailor-made fight, you could even say, with a kickboxer. That's that classic, you know, grappler versus striker matchup, but I don't know how he does against some of the better wrestlers in the division. I'd love to see it. Uh, I don't even know if they're going to, what are they going to do? Are they going to put him against a top 10 guy right away, or are they going to give him, who do you think they're going to give they him? They have to. I think off the screen, we're talking about some someone who makes for an interesting stylistic matchup. Not yet that tough kind of wrestling takedown D that you're talking about, but someone who's also a BJJ expert, but in a different world, in the leg locking world, who has a similar kind of record and is in the UFC and has had trouble getting guys willing to fight him. He seems so to be cool. Ryan Hall, who yeah. recently yeah, the wizard. leg locked the previously never tapping BJ Penn. The legend, yeah, he put him down. Um, I love that fight. I want that fight in Brazil. At UFC 237. <laughs> oh, man. That with the Diaz good. brothers. Throw the Diaz brothers on the card with Connor, man. And, hey. and Anderson Well, Silva. Nate doesn't want to fight anymore. And if he doesn't want to fight, I don't want to see him fight. Yeah. If Nate's down to run it back with Connor, of course, I'd love to see that trilogy. That trilogy, to me, it, it ends on a tie. And you say, you know, the tie is always like kissing your sibling. Yeah. So it's not a bad thing, but it's not a great thing. I'd love it to be the inaugural 165 fight. Because... I mean, oh, that would be a great way to introduce it because Connor complained that, that it should have been at 155, 170 he was too big. Let's just do it at 165 and get that division started because you know what? There's way too much talent in 155 and 170. They need to split it up into three different... Would you give them a belt? 
No, I think you can just have it as a 165 fight, and then match. afterwards, why don't they just copy that awesome Bellator format of a Grand Prix, it, yeah. and just grab some 170 guys, grab some 155 guys, and really have them throw it out. And that'd be, you yeah. know, we can't even talk about this on another podcast, but where we decide who should be in that tournament. Kevin that Lee. Be, like, oh, let's not uh, get into the whole thing. Rafael Dos Anjos. Yeah, of course. Plenty Cowboy of guys. Cowboy Cerrone. Plenty of guys. There are tons of names. That would fit in that in between. But yeah, back to the UFC in Phoenix, man. Honestly, I felt like that was the people's main event. Everyone talked about Ngannou Velasquez, and obviously that disappointed, and that was down to my overall disappointment for the weekend. That like really. But why are you disappointed? I want to push you back on that. That was that was a second time that Francis Ngannou has TKO'd someone who is great at wrestling on paper and in action, and then who has kind of maybe you'd say medium level striking. Yeah. Well, here's my thing, and there was a bunch of videos on Twitter and whatnot that showed Velasquez's training where he didn't look as sharp, and there was one where he, like, I think he slipped, and everyone thought that he had, like, a, a knee injury that started, flared up there. Um, there's all this stuff going around that saying that Kane had a buckled knee, and that's why he went down in the fight, and it wasn't really a finish, but I saw some highlights and some clips where he definitely got rocked by an uppercut by Ngannou, but I was, you know, I was disappointed because yeah. Kane is so-called heavyweight GOAT, and you're, he goes into this fight, and everyone's waiting for two years for him to come back from the so many surgeries, the bone spurs, the you know the back problems, and now he comes in, he fights for thirty seconds, and he's gone. I don't know. I felt that. I was mean, I never forget two things. One, it it seems to be a false dichotomy a lot of people are setting up, or a false binary, and they're saying either there was a knee slip due to these former injuries. Or Ngannou knocked them out. I don't think it's an either or. I think it could be both. There's no reason. These things aren't mutually exclusive. Yeah. It could be the case. Remember, the second thing I was going to mention is that Ngannou, on whatever power meter check for punches, which reminds me of like the power meter from Dragon Ball Z when they used yeah, to have I don't know how accurate those so, things are, man. But People be throwing he, he knocked that out of the record. The, the closest, if I recall, is something like 700 or 800, and he got like 1,200 on whatever that's measuring it. So the impact from his uppercut that you just mentioned could wobble through Kane's body and reactivate an injury that he thought was oh, healed man. and maybe that injury was <laughs> 90%, but it took it back down. I wouldn't go that far, but I would, I would, you know, I could see some of your points there. I, I, I could see it. Um, but for me, you know, I don't know. It just didn't live up to it. And I can kind of say a lot of fights didn't live up to expectation this weekend. And it wasn't just the UFC stuff. It was... Man, Bellator had a really bad weekend for so many reasons. Let me tell you why. Why? Yeah, I, I liked. I thought I liked the fight that I watched with you with uh, Roy Big Country Nelson versus Mirko Krokrop. Oh, that was a great fight. Great fight. I'm sad there wasn't a finish. But that was a great fight. Yeah. But MVP versus Daily was the most anticipated fight in Bellator history. I mean, you at Twitter, everything was on fire for MVP versus Daly. They wanted to see that striking matchup. They wanted to see two guys really high level going at it. And they were just like scared of each other. I don't know if it was- MVP wasn't scared. MVP was a smooth criminal in there. <sighs> he was a smooth, he was, his whole style is that point karate, point Taekwondo. He's got that touch karate you, stance. Touch sure. you? Walk away. Yeah. Touch you, walk away. One, two combo, get away. One, go away. One, go away. Yeah. So he was just tapping him, touching him. And there were a couple times where Daly was actually showing signs of a of a flurry. This wasn't the snooze fest that was in Ganu Lewis. No. There no, were of course there not. were some of real blows being thrown. But but the big thing, the elephant in the room, the big hypocrisy was that and, and maybe maybe we're calling it hypocrisy, but Maybe for him, it's brilliance in <laughs> in fight IQ or fight EQ in fooling the whole world because he he was criticizing John Fitch, even booing booing John Fitch and speaking to Moro and the other announcers like Big John McCarthy during his fight with John Fitch yeah. because he was uh, grapple fucking them as they say. But Wrestling now fucking, yeah. he was trying to do that to MVP when we were expecting basically. Uh, either like an unwritten agreement or a formal agreement to have a kickboxing match. But this was an MMA match, and what he did was fully legit. It's just hypocritical. You know, I think a lot of this has to do with 
I don't know if we would have saw the same fight if there wasn't a million dollars on the line. With Bellator from 50 having cent? from fifty cent, yeah. with Bellator having all this money on the line, all this like accolades on the line, I think that they fight in this very like careful way. You're not going to get a crazy brawl because you know what? Why would you throw that money away if you got that opportunity? You're going to fight in the most you know like strategic way possible. And Daly maybe just went through a full wrestling camp and said, "I'm going to take this guy down." And to be honest, how bad does MVP's wrestling have to be if it's getting taken down by Daly all day? You know, I I've, I saw some people commenting like that on Twitter, you know, namely uh, the great Ben Askren and others like that. What I would say to contend with that point is Paul Daly, people view him as a brawler, but he is a veteran of the MMA sport. I think he's and got 20 knockouts, I mean 30 knockouts and no submissions. And 40 wins though, he's 40 wins. I know, but it's, he's a knockout. And he's got, he does have those, what, two submission to strikes? So that counts. Oh, <laughs> come on. Submission to strikes. Oh, come on. But what I was going to say is, I don't think you spend this much time with this many fights in MMA and you don't know how to wrestle. So I feel like... I mean, he didn't technically look that good with his well, wrestling. Maybe he's been using this as a trump card. And maybe he's not the greatest wrestler on just, earth. I just think his techniques for his single leg and double leg was just not great. This just, just lucky to me, this calls to mind. People were critical of Al Yaquinta when he was fighting five rounds on basically no notice with Habib, who's the champion at 155, and who people who train with him say he walks around at 205. He survived five rounds when Connor couldn't do that. And then he goes on to beat Kevin Lee, who Kevin Lee said that he would he would ragdoll Habib. Oh, I, I and, think and this rings to me that like styles make fights. Of course. It, it, it's not necessarily true that, you know, Yakinta is bad because he, he was beaten the whole time. And it's I don't not think true Yikinta that Paul Daly's like grappling Paul is bad. Daly. It think, might be MVP's D is great. No, I think that Yakinta has like probably the best toughest fight for Khabib in his whole career so far. And I thought I don't think you can compare it to more him. more than uh, Chandler, who got no. a clean hit, or not Chandler. What's no, his name? No, no, no. Michael Johnson, Michael who Johnson. got a clean hit on him. No, I think I think that was an easy fight for Khabib. I think uh, like the the only guy who he had a really tough time, and he maybe lost a couple rounds to was Al. I mean, he definitely won that fight, but Al gave him a huge fight. I don't think you can compare the two right there. But you know that wasn't honestly. Yes, I was disappointed in that fight, but I think a lot of fights were disappointing for Bellator. Or I feel like there's like few little changes they can make that could make things more interesting or could make things work better and one of those was that I feel like they should have combined the last two events they had an event on Friday night and an event on Saturday night both at the same arena I think it's the Mohegan Sun the Indian tribe and Connecticut Connecticut right so they could have just combined those into one event and it would have been stacked it would have had MVP Daily it would have had uh, Karatanov and Mitrion both same night would have been great and then, you know, it wouldn't, it would be less of a sting. Like when you watch the Mitrion versus Karatana fight, where, which ended on one nut kick, and that was the end of the fight, and he couldn't continue. And then you got like the MVP daily situation, which we already discussed, was a little disappointing. I don't know. I feel like Bellator has like so many opportunities to be great and to really surpass even UFC because they're doing, Coker, Scott Coker is very good at, at booking great fights. He's great at matchmaking and that's, that's something I think he might be even better at than Sean Shelby and Dana White and all those guys that over at Mick Maynard. Well because fighting in this sense, full fighting, you know, even though there's these ancient pancreationist roots, is still a young sport in the contemporary sense. And these are all fledgling organizations. The UFC the most established, Bellator far less established but they're growing. These are the growing pains, sure, man. But what we I'm don't saying, have that perfect organization No, but Scott yet. Coker might You know I'm still looking for that bare knuckle, no time limits, no weight limits, raw, absolute, open best versus the yeah, best, no, I guess. excellent versus but excellent. But Scott Coker has been around for a while. He yeah. was the head of Strike Force. Strike Force, You yeah. know, he was around longer than Dana almost, you know, like around the, around the business, you know? Yeah. And, I mean, maybe that's not exactly true, but I don't know the exact details. But what I'm saying is... Fact like, check them, fam. Fact check, exactly. It's fact check, that's for sure. But I think that the way they've been making their fights has been a little bit strange. Like, they've been bringing their prospects along a little too quickly. And that happened on Friday night with Mike Kimball being on the main card. Um, and that dude is a savage. That's his nickname, Mike the Savage Kimball. He knocks people out in the first round. He's a fucking monster. Huge reach and height for his 
division at 135. Prospect MVP got that dub, though, against Daly, like we were just talking sure, about. Sure, sure, but... The thing is, though, I think maybe it's too early to rush him into a main main card slot against a tough guy, BJJ guy, where he probably himself, he's like, I think he's a blue belt in Connecticut. And you know what? He's pretty, he was solid, but he definitely got uh, caught. And I think that same thing happened with Pico. You know, you rush him into a tough fight. Corrales was a tough fight a few a month back. And then you get the hype train that gets stopped. And I, I appreciate well, Yeah, what's the Pope. alternative? Baby then? Yeah, give them shit. Like fights. Know, you can complain either way. You can complain just, that they're rushing them. Just like, give them little clay pigeons to shoot with shotguns. Yeah, you no, know what that's I'm saying? true. And like, Pico's asking combat. for it. Pico's a different situation. Force. Pico's asking for the toughest guys all the time. But you run into these problems when you're building stars. Like the UFC's trying to build stars. Bellator's trying to build stars. Something that's marketable that brings audiences in. And when you see a, a young star get knocked out, you start caring less. I don't know if the hype for Pico's next fight is going to be there as it was for the Corrales fight. I don't know if Mike Kimball, per se, is going to have the hype for his next fight. We'll have to see. He only has two losses, so I think Pico's going to come back. And for me, he's got the requisite kind of skill set. If you looked at him like a, he was a video game character, if somebody else was in control, you know what I'm saying? Joe Rogan or Brennan Shaw, one of them, they were talking to each other and they said, Basically, he just needs to obey T.J. Dillashaw. If he just follows the route of T.J. <laughs> Dillashaw, and they're in the same camp with uh, Calisetta in that garage, and yeah. then they've got the training lab. I don't know if he's lab. doing go and bang, though. I don't know. If he's not doing yeah. that. Well, I think he's just with Freddie yeah. Roach and doing boxing. boxing. I don't know if he's yeah. doing that Muay Thai. And that he's not boxing. doing the Muay Thai, but he doesn't need to necessarily accept, you know, that type of Muay Thai. That, that boss rookie style. I mean, the style of fighting and the training style. You know, yeah. about being more methodical. And as you were saying, as Paul Daly went to his calculated tech, like what I was saying, his fight IQ and EQ is in the sense of being a calculated defeater of opponents rather than someone who's just searching for a viral highlight reel that's going to get you guaranteed CTE <laughs> and losses. Under I mean, record, that's making it a 50 50 fight as opposed to a technical fight. Yeah. I mean, that's, you have the advantage. that's what I mean. That's what I said about Luke and his fight and it's like very similar to Pico where he doesn't defend and he's just going to wear every shot, you know, and that's like a lot of problem with fighters that are really talented. They're going to fucking get wrecked, especially when they win. Yeah. At least Pico yeah. lost so he could learn from that. Luke won, so he might not change his strategy. Yeah, that's true. I mean, we'll and it was a last second one, man. I think actually, Jeez. I saw the scorecards. Someone posted the scorecards after the fight for yeah. Luke and Barbarina, and it was, I think they had Brian winning the fight up to the point. I think they had 10 Honestly, 10 9. if if you're, it depends on your value. If your value is sheer like strikes landed, the boy was just tapping him at one point. He was yeah. like, tap, tap, tap. Let me just tap you from different angles. And you could say from a kind of negative perspective that he was just trying to score strikes landed. Yeah. But I secretly think he was trying to get him used to and accustomed to these light taps. And then he was searching for an opening to get a big one. Right. I think he was just trying to get weird on him. I yeah. think he was just trying to like, you know, just throw him off. Because, you know, he's so technical and good that he probably trains with these really technical guys. And that's you're right. running into a guy that's awkward, kind of throwing weird yeah. shit at you. You're not really ready for it. But at Reminds the same time, I think... RDA the, Tony Ferguson. Ah, but Tony's the weirdest. You don't want to yeah. tell you about the weird conversation with Tony. You can't... He's the ranking, highest ranking on the weird list. Um, pound but for pound weirdest. Pound for one weirdest is definitely Tony Ferguson. And we mean that in the most beautiful way. You also love you, Tony. Tony Fantastic. Ferguson, please do not darse us. <laughs> exactly. It just didn't live up to Israel and Anderson. MVP Daily just just didn't live up to that. You know, like, I felt satisfied with Israel and, and, and Anderson. Yeah, that was the pinnacle of the striking arts and sciences within MMA. I haven't watched enough kickboxing and Muay Thai fights to say about what the striking arts and sciences would be like there. But at least as it pertains to, to MMA, that was some of the best striking I've ever seen because you had two counter strikers who were cautiously striking each other most of them were lighter taps, but there were some strong blows too, and they went for it. They went for some head kicks. They went some from, from some strong rights and even some hooks. But at the same time, Anderson Silva was trying to bait Israel more, and Israel was at, at some points dancing around the man yeah. who dances around other people. And that's no knock on Anderson because he could still beat a lot of people in the top 10 
and a ton of people all over the world at age 43, about to be 44. No, he's a legend. Israel, young buck around age 30, around our age, is seeming to be I don't one like of the I stars of age that. out there in the world, but go ahead. <laughs> a plus or minus. It could be a margin yeah, of five yeah. years, ten yeah, years, yeah, thirty please, years. Take note of that. We're speaking sure. loosely. Yeah. But that type of striking is, is rarely seen and I just appreciate it, you know, as a fan I would have liked to see it go more rounds. I did hear Israel comment that his side was willing to take it. Five on rounds. short notice, five rounds. Right. You know the the sad occurrence with Robert Whitaker and makes total his, sense. His bowels, right? Shit, in. man, that was. But uh, Silva's camp was not ready to go. That they trained of course, for three. And, years old, you know, yeah. fairness, justice wise, yeah. I I understand that. But yeah, man. In conclusion, white belt MMA. We out here to talk about as many different combat sports as we pay attention to. There's gonna be more K1 stuff, more Lefay. Lefay. Some head butting. We're gonna be all bare over the knuckle way. Shout out to Kaposa for making the list of all the events. We're gonna be all up on it. Thank you so much. Yeah. For that service. And thank y'all for listening.